My name is Todd Lohr. I am a senior geological engineer at the RISC Army Corps Risk Management Center in Lakewood, Colorado. As you can see from my backdrop, hopefully, I'm coming to you from uh, from Racetrack Playa in Death Valley. <laughs> anyway, I'm here to give a presentation on the the best practices chapter A2 called geologic geotechnical information required for risk assessments. And I know that many folks on the call or watching may have uh, quite a bit of experience with geological site characterization, geotechnical engineering, and probably uh, how they relate with dams and dam safety assessments. But um, this chapter of best practices is put early on in the in the workshops so that it helps to emphasize how valuable and important compiling and pulling this sort of information together uh, ahead of the risk assessment and then how we can use it to inform our our evaluation and also how we use it to evaluate our level of uncertainty related to failure modes that are identified. So we're going to go through um, some things that maybe are somewhat familiar, but I'm trying to put them into the context of how does that information get incorporated and used for, um, for, for, for ending with a good quality um, product, a good quality risk assessment and good communication of that information. So the outline of this chapter is to present the the main primary objectives and key concepts that are associated with Chapter A2. We're going to talk a little bit also about uh, geologic and geotechnical event trees. I have some examples that are scattered um, into the overall content of the presentation. We're going to talk about the primary geological and geotechnical contributions. Where are those main contributions? They're on seismic, hydrologic and, and static assessments for various failure modes for, for dam safety assessments. And then how do we portray and communicate the, the most relevant geologic information effectively? And we'll sum up with some takeaway points at the end. I have a slide here from Charles Berkey where he and, and others have said this, uh, Carl Terzaghi being one, that, that geological and foundation conditions are, are one of the most primary reasons why dams do not perform or have caused failures. So over 70% of, of failures are related to the foundation. So this information, how we compile and understand and characterize a site with respect to geology and geotech is very, very important in having a quality risk assessment. So the overall objectives of chapter two are to understand what the primary geologic and geotechnical influences are for various potential failure modes. We need to know um, which components, which things, which, which subsurface conditions at a site contribute to the development and the assessment of, of the various failure modes of different types of structures. We need to be able to uh, summarize geologic geotechnical conditions uh, the physical properties, geometries, identify the geologic hazards and the associated uncertainties that influence potential failure mode sequencing, no, nodal sequencing, and, and ultimately how those how that information gets incorporated into the, the team's risk characterization of, of that failure mode. And hopefully we also learn to understand that uh, there's there's huge importance in compiling the most relevant geotechnical and geologic data and portraying it and communicating it effectively to a multidisciplinary team of technical folks who, who may or may not have geologic or geotechnical background. Um, and, and that goes to another point too that I like to emphasize is, is as, a, as a geologist, engineering geologist, geotech, ask questions and, and understand as much as you can of all the other disciplines and all the other uh, technical components that go into uh, dam safety assessments, failure mode development, and, and the risk assessment. The more you know about all aspects of dam, dam engineering, the better you are at identifying the pertinent data that's relevant to those assessments. 
So um, a lot of times this portraying and communicating part is also called building the case. That's where we justify our interpretation with a logical and, and reasonable sequence of assessments that's portrayed perhaps in, in figures and graphs and maps and, and in addition to writing. So that's what we're gonna try to uh, emphasize here in this presentation. Some of the key concepts for, for this chapter are, um, what are the roles of geologists, geotechnical engineers in the risk assessment? Um, most risk assessment teams should include geotechnical engineer and an engineering geologist with sufficient experience in dam engineering to understand which aspects of those two disciplines um, contribute specifically and, and support assessment of, of each type of failure mode that the team um, assess over over the period of the risk assessment. So it's good to have people with experience that know lots of different parts of, of dam safety and, and dam engineering. Um, geologists need to identify and evaluate the site characteristics, uh, build a conceptual site model, need to understand the, the site geologic hazards that are present and how all those are pertinent to each different type of failure mode that may be evaluated during the, during the risk assessment. Uh, both, both geologists and geotechs contribute significantly to the seismic and hydrologic loading, as well as assessing the static loading uh, failure mode estimates. Um, we also tend to help constrain we need to be able to constrain the uncertainties related to all the subsurface conditions and communicate those as well to the team. What do we know? What are we interpreting? How strong are we in our interpretation that, that our interpretation is, is valid and correct? Um, and then what don't we know? Those things need to be assessed kind of early and, and brought into the risk assessment with, with some in some context. Oh, and then we need to communicate, participate in, and or lead the project risk assessment. Many geologists at the Army Corps and at Bureau will, will gain enough experience to, to move into those roles of leading and running and directing the risk assessment, facilitating them, and uh, getting the whole team to kind of migrate through all the steps and all the assessment process. Um, this is a very important topic to me, this last bullet, be prepared ahead of the risk assessment. As much information as we can compile, as much information as we can synthesize and put into a, um, a understandable format, figures, graphs, maps, plots, that sort of thing, the better we are at spending the time during the risk assessment discussing the uncertainties and discussing the the, the conditions that relate to our risk elicitation. If we come into the risk assessment, we don't have all this information already, or we're filtering through boxes, or we're, 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 we're going through old maps and old drawings, we really don't know. We're, we're basically building our, our concept model on the fly. You have to have it built. You have to understand the conditions before we go into the risk assessment. It's been a valuable, aspect of our process here is to get the cadres to understand those those conditions ahead of time and then we can focus on assessing the risk rather than building our concepts this is a general list of all the typical data that may or may not be available at a pro project site um, there's a lot of information and maybe it's it's spread out through many different offices or many different archive areas and we need to try to gain as much access to it as we can. If there's borings logs somewhere and you've seen them referenced in a foundation plan report but no one can find the logs, I would say you know request as much as you can, push as much as you can to get as much of this data as possible because we need to compile it, understand it, for the risk assessment in the context of the, the identified failure modes and be able to verbally and, and qualitatively show what our uncertainty is with all this data. Some projects may have in crazy amount of data, overwhelming amount. Some may have almost none. So you're limited in your 
assessment and in your, your development of your site characterization based on how much data you have access to. But that is hugely influential on the relative uncertainties that we have to characterize as well. So the more data, the more synthesis, the more understanding of the site that can happen before the risk assessment is just better. This is an example of an event tree for a potential uh, seismic liquefaction and crest deformation failure mode. You can see it's broken out into the various nodes and we have the, the seismic and reservoir loading kind of at the front part of this event tree. These are both areas where engineering geologists and geotechs contribute. Talk about that in a couple slides coming up. And then the response. What is the response of the system? What's the response of the foundation? Is it large scale liquefaction? Is there, is it just in a small channel area that maybe it doesn't doesn't lend itself to broad wide scale foundation failure. Then what's the behavior of the structure? Does the structure fully deform enough to breach the pool elevation? Does it does it does it settle or have enough stress induced features like cracks or or slope failures that weaken it and then those can lead to to failure. So site characterization plays a strong strong aspect in defining the event trees and then assessing the likelihood and uncertainties related to each of those nodes. Uh, so on the seismic loading, the geology, geotech folks might contribute to assessing the, the, the loading itself. We identify the earthquake ground sources, characterize activity rates and magnitudes and offsets and distances to the site. We estimate the ground motions and exceedance rates, develop shaking time histories, and all that goes into the loading analysis. Um, and and that, might, that might be a place where, where a lot of input from geology and geotechs is, is needed way up front. You need to have that all figured out and, and as, you know, as well understood as possible with the time and the scope of the project. There also may be unique cases where there's actual ground rupture issues. For example, like at Isabella Dam, where there's a, a Kern Canyon fault in the right abutment of the dike structure. So we may need to define fault location, fault activity, the width, uh, potential displacements and slip. And we may need to uh, characterize that for, for future, for mod studies and what's the, what's the uncertainty with the activity of that structure as well. So all that is is where we can contribute on the front end for the loading nodes. Uh, constraining the contrib contributions to the hydraulic loading, that, that's not quite, le quite as obvious, but um, a lot of the hydraulic loading curves and, and hydraulic data is based on generally much younger um, data sets, so maybe up to 100 years or so. So most of that data comes and we fit these modeling curves to that data and we have generally high confidence in the lower parts of our hydraulic loading curve. But for the most part, we project that data, you know, out into less frequent and higher magnitude events. And, and what we can do is, is try to constrain that, that point that's out on the far end of the hydrologic loading curve with geomorphic paleo flood stage type studies where we look for the de deposits, age of deposits, deposits related to paleo flooding, deposits that are above that perhaps that are not related to flooding, put a, put a non-exceedance parameter on there. And with that information, sometimes we can refine and uh, uh, modify the hydro hydrologic loading curve and perhaps we end up with a different um, different shape, different probabilities of low frequency, large magnitude events. Doesn't always have to move in a favorable direction either. It, it can move both directions, but uh, it's it's valuable. It's not always applicable at every site. Has to have the unique conditions, and it needs somebody somewhat experienced in this effort so that they can they can really move forward and assess how how that is going to be applied. All right, site characterization is a broad topic and it, it involves, from a geologic perspective and foundation perspective, it involves 
um, developing a conceptual model of the foundation of the site geologic and geotechnical conditions. So what that is is a is a, it's a kind of a mental three dimensional depiction of the spatial subsurface conditions, the physical attributes, the engineering properties that that the site conforms to and accounts for. Meaning it has to fit, you know, our model has to fit what we are observing and what the data is showing us and what instrumentation is showing us. And so we need to build this concept model in a way that we can then communicate it. So so this this conceptual model will form the basis for our interpretations and it forms the basis of our communication of the data to the rest of the project team. The conceptual model has to be sufficiently detailed, has to be defensible, verifiable, meaning uh, additional data that we can collect or find somewhere will help us confirm, refute, or possibly revise that concept mod mod model. So it's a it's an iterative process and, and following the scientific method of building your concept and and assessing information, building your conceptual model revising it as new data as uh, uh, merges and incorporated into the model. So we need to be able to capture and portray those subsurface conditions and variability and, and scaled to each particular risk assessment, right? So we need to communicate this information to often to people who are not don't have geologic or geotechnical backgrounds. So we need to create a way to do that with maps, 2D geologic cross sections, diagrams, figures, graphics, plots, with all the supporting data and analysis compiled in a way that's graphically observable and digestible in quick amount of time. Sometimes we might use 3D geological models, fence diagrams or block models. Uh, to communicate. Sometimes they're just graphics. Sometimes we can also put them on the maps and spatially lay things out. For me, everything, all these things build our, our concept model. So we need this to come. We need to compile all this and organize the qualitative factors that either facilitate a failure mode from occurring or prevent a failure mode from occurring. And we can do this while we're building that concept model, while the geologist is working to understand the site, identifying the most likely failure modes, and then as they go through their data set, keep track of or tabulate what are these factors that might either make that failure mode more likely or what are those factors that might make that failure mode less likely and keep that in your mind or keep that tabulated somewhere. It's really valuable to come prepared into the risk assessment with that information because then it all gets redigested and discussed. And that's that's what the risk assessment process is, communication. All right, and then on the static loading side of things, we have we have to identify what those static loading failure modes are, are going to be at our project site. So here's a bullet list of four general failure modes that probably come up for every project, right? We have internal erosion of soils and concentrated leak erosion or, or conduit along a conduit or a contact. So we have to think about those failure modes. We think about weak foundation materials related to instability of the structure, bedrock dissolution or bedrock or rock mass strength might be related to deformations, seismic deformations for a concrete structure, or rock scour, um, rock scour for a spillway or overtopping event. And then we have to maybe think about landslides in and around the dam. This is only four examples of some failure modes that the geologist geotech needs to think about that project moving forward. It may not get them all. You may not see them all because some of them get um, get come to light as the discussion moves, but those are the things that you need to think about while you're compiling this data because then it lets you start to think about what data might be the most useful at this risk assessment. Maybe um, it helps you identify the, the, the components of geologic variability, um, characterize the units, site conditions that are that are away from the dam or close to the dam. What are the site formational or depositional processes? What's the spatial relationship of all these conditions in the foundation that form the abutments or the reservoir rim or, or the actual uh, foundation conditions? Bedrock, 
we maybe need to know something about bedrock structure, jointing fractures, discontinuities, permeability, and placement, deformational history, continuity, engineering properties. And for uh, alluvium or even, you know, any any quaternary soil deposits, we probably need to know something about the depositional process, the geometries, the characteristics, the physical characteristics that they might have, relationships between the different types of deposits that are out of sight. Continuity is a huge aspect of most um, failure modes that relate to soil in the in the foundation and dam or levees. So we need to know what's the spatial continuity, vertical and horizontal extent of these adverse features and then of course all the engineering features so these are things that you're thinking of while we're going through all the data pulling it out identifying the potential failure modes early in your head and then making sure we're getting the data that supports or informs those failure modes so additional geologic and geotechnical contributions um, we have to really understand what the primary sources are of uncertainty how can the geologic information address the uncertainties that we are identifying? How much do we know? How much confidence do we have that away from away from a few points that you can make a prediction of what the conditions are? And then what don't we know? Where do we have uncertainties? Where are there alternative interpretations that might be adequate out of sight? So we have to constrain this uncertainty and we, we do that by, by estimating the center body and the range of what the realistic uncertainties are based on the geologic variability in, in, a, in the, at the project site. So, so we, 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 we maybe have high confidence that a certain condition exists in a certain area, but we have lower, lower confidence that it exists at some spatial distance away. What is the, our confidence? What's our feeling that this, level of uncertainty we can we can put a bound on and the trick here is really not wanting to get too conservative not wanting to push those uncertainties out to unrealistic um, values we really need to constrain our distribution with using realistic uncertainty based on our geologic site assessment and not always do we have to put statistical values onto our uncertainty sometimes it's more qualitative where we can Kind of bound our properties and bound our bound our parameters uh, in a way that's not necessarily you know a mathematical function, but it's descriptive, right? So the one way we do this is to categorize all of our observations, all of the site conditions that make the failure mode either more likely or make the failure mode less likely. And again, we can we compile all those things and separate the things that are positives and negatives for the failure mode. And that really helps us understand where our uncertainty is, in my, my view. So this is a block diagram of many different uh, quaternary type depositional settings. And from, our, from, from school, we learned that geology is a process-based discipline. We understand our site by applying the principles of physics, geology, depositional systems, and we know something about those systems as we move forward. We know that alluvial fans and, and glacial and, and maybe fluvial systems tend to have the most variability. They have variability in grain size, variability in distribution, variability in, in depth and thickness and, and um, material engineering properties. Maybe other types of systems are have less variability, but, but all that tells us something about what the possible engineering characteristics are in those depositional systems. So in the absence of complete information of the subsurface condition, we can characterize the foundation material and we can make some judgment about the spatial extent and delineation of different types of depositional systems. So this table is sort of um, an example of, of the typical properties that we might find for different depositional environments. So if we are in a, a beach environment, we may have some, we may be able to make a pretty convincing case that we might have certain physical conditions and we might be able to make a case we have certain physical distribution. Same with some glacial 
conditions or fluvial conditions. So, so the, the geomorphology does put bounds and parameters on what we can and can't know at a at a foundation, you know, in the subsurface. But we can follow these principles to better develop our assessment. So there's some, as you're working through all this information, we want to get to the geologic and geotechnical con contribution questions, right? Are there erodible sands and silt continuous beneath the dam or levee that represent an internal erosion failure mode? So to do that, we need to understand the depositional environments, the stratigraphic models, the gradients that exist, and the potential engineering properties and uncertainty that might exist related to that failure mode. And we have to keep in mind spatial distribution of those systems and geometrical complexity that may exist at a site. Other technical questions we may be interested in, in thinking about as we move through, these are just examples. You know, these aren't all the questions that you have to ask, but this is sort of an example of this thought process as we're prepping and as we're building our conceptual model of the, of the site and the PMFs. What are the potentiometric gradients along a seepage flow path? Well, we need to get instrumentation and construction information. We need to get a performance and temporal spatial results with respect to maybe the reservoir elevation, tailwater elevation, and maybe precipitation, right? So we need to know all those things or find data or hunt them down or, or at least acquire, you know, if they're available. Uh, what are the dam and levee foundation conditions prior to and during construction? Are there observations in the construction records or construction photos and or other documents that help provide insight into what was observed during construction? How did they treat certain features? Are there photographs, construction photographs? Are there drill data? Are there is there information? Was there a problem during construction? Right? So all those things have to be kind of running through your brain as you're going through all this data. Where are these little puzzle pieces that we're trying to pull out of this data set to make the big picture of the site characterization model? Um, how likely is the slope of foundation instability related to the bedrock? Discontinuities or weathering. So we need to know something about rock strength, rock mechanics, um, ge geometry of, of discontinuities, and maybe we can get that from construction photos, aerial imagery, drill data, foundation, treatment reports and that sort of thing. So, so these are the questions that we're asking related to failure modes during development of our conceptual model. And then these are the questions that we needed to be asking and that things we're looking for answers for. So this is an example of a pretty simplified geologic cross section that just has boreholes and then general interpretation of where certain types of depositional features exist in the dam foundation. So, the, the problem with this is that it's so simplified. It's too cartoony. It's too just making connections between points that are spread out too far. And it really leaves us with uncertainty. We don't really have a good feel for what this data is telling us. So we went back on this project and dug through the archives and pulled out way more data and then brought it all into graphical representation that really helps everybody look through this stuff and digest it and see what's going on and it provides a whole heck of a lot more information about the subsurface condition when we're able to pull in all this stuff and really build our case for what the foundation condition is relative to the failure mode that's being evaluated. Here's a there's a second example in, in bedrock at a project that had a void and all these types of information are are rooted through in all the other document locations and they're pulled into graphics or spatial spatial uh, control systems GIS or or CAD or something like that where we can pull all this information together and build our case and present and communicate it way more effectively than if we are looking at all these things individually. This is another example of the structural contours for major bedding planes and partings um, on a concrete gravity dam. So, you know, where do these failure planes daylight? Do they daylight downstream? Or, or is the topography downstream pushing these failure, daylighting failure planes far, far downstream? So, so do sections map things out. We have to plot and build our case with graphics and 
and a well thought through plan of how how structures exist. So when we head out to a site, we may not know something or, or, or we may have borings that are spaced quite some distance apart. So we drill those holes and then we look at the data and a lot of times we just make fairly simplified connections between these boreholes. And, and it depends on the site conditions, depends on the on the setting and uh, and, and what what the geologic con, um, history has been at a site. But a lot of times these horizontal layer cake type settings are, are, are not actually that well depicting the subsurface conditions, which may be way more complicated. So if we if we base our PFM and our risk assessment on assumptions of, of certain um, extrapolations of data that's incorrect, then then we really are not um, adequately communicating or, or assessing the, the magnitude of that risk. We may have too many uncertainties. We may uh, have too many factors that are un, uh, unknown that we need to account for. So an um, uh, 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 incredibly useful and informative tool that is used in dam safety assessments, risk assessments, is to pull as much information, much spatial information together into a layered model that consists of things like aerial imagery, spatial information that you can derive from LIDAR, from uh, geologic maps, from sections, from topo, from, from lineation studies or fracture mapping studies, from investigation data that we can plot or, or bring on to the spatial information. Geophysics can go on to these as well. We can use Google Earth, we can use GIS, we can use CAD, there's Rockworks, LeapFrog, MicroStation. There's a lot of different models out there or formats to pull this data together. Um, it can also get construction documentation plans layouts, um, footprints, uh, topo, all these things make it so much better if we have this available during the risk assessment. So this model is pulled up, it's projected on a screen and we can fly through and move and turn things on, turn things off, see where things are interconnected, see where, see where things are um, uh, telling us the story and informing our assessment of the, of the risk of a particular failure mode. So uncertainty of subsurface conditions is uh, contribute significantly to the likelihood estimate of failure and into you know, how confident we are in our risk assessment. So uncertainty is, is what we're really trying to um, re re um, reduce by doing all this work uh, ahead of time. Often we're limited by the data and time and quality of the compilation and the interpretation. So this risk assessment and, and this process is really iterative or sequential. So as new data becomes available, we review it, compile it, understand it, synthesize, summarize it, try to bring it into a spatial platform that is, we can start making some of these um, judgments about relationships between different puzzle pieces. We extract the relevant data that's, uh, that is most uh, attributable to the, the identified failure modes. And we have to be able to communicate it to the rest of the project team. Then during the PFMA, we sit down with all this information and we develop the, the write-ups for the failure modes under various loading scenarios. Once we have an identify, once we have identified those risk driving failure modes, we can go back into our data set, our geologic data set, and bring out more of our understanding, dig a little deeper and, and really focus on characterizing the subsurface conditions relative to those risk driving failure modes, rather than going down a rabbit hole and chasing or doing work on something that, that doesn't really affect the risk as much as, as the ones that are identified. So we compile all those factors that either promote or resist the failure mode from occurring. So those are the more and less likely factors. We pull all those together, but those tell us qual qualitatively what our relative uncertainty is, and it also helps guide the risk characterization. We make a determination of if more data or site characterization would, would significantly change the order of magnitude of our risk assessment. So if, if additional data would not really change that risk too much, then maybe it's not worth pursuing, but, but maybe some other data might help inform the 
the risk assessment, reduce uncertainty, and we might actually end up with a different uh, magnitude of risk assessment. And then we go and I and perform maybe more detailed engineering analysis, uh, data compilation or field investigations that target those specific nodes or components of a failure mode. So we, we, we hone in on it and then we go through this loop again and revise. So this is a typical event tree for a rock for embankment material scour into foundation that is composed of fractured fractured rock material. So the sequence is that we have loading, we have um, open discontinuities, open and consistent discontinuities that there's a flaw in the treatment, you know, that the contractor and uh, the, the CM on site, maybe they didn't or the designers didn't include foundation treatment, or maybe maybe they did, and we need to find that record. Um, what are the gradients across the core, and are they significant enough to drive material into fractured rock mass? Then we have continuation of that process and lack of clogging. We have unsuccessful intervention, then we, that all leads to breach. But what we see is that these first three nodes relate pretty specifically to geologic, geotechnical, and hydrologic hydrogeologic uncertainties in the foundation and in the abutment material. So for this first node, we need to have open continuous network of joints from the core that extend an, an interconnected system that extend downstream some distance. So, so that is something we can go do. We can do field mapping, we can do inspections, we can maybe drill sample tests or look at more construction photos, and maybe we can glean more information. We can evaluate the foundation treatment and effectiveness if we can get a hold of those construction documents and maybe d dive a little deeper into some of the reports. And then initiation, maybe there is some information on, on phreatic surface and on pressures and, and hydraulic driving conditions that are in the, the abutment. So there's information we can get and do more studies that will help inform this failure mode. So what we end up with is this more likely or less likely factors. These are the adverse factors and these are the favorable factors on the right. And those either support or, um, or restrict the failure mode or the failure mode nodes from advancing. So at the beginning, we might have low confidence because we didn't have a lot of this information. If we don't have it, we might have low confidence. We overestimate, we maybe estimated the risk pretty high because we didn't have too much understanding. But then we can go and do field work or get more data or do more analysis, and we end up potentially increasing our confidence because we're able to compile and build our site conceptual model in a way that that better communicates the realistic conditions and, and the actual physics of this failure mode. So that's the point of working through that. that that's that sequence. Okay. So where does this all all lead us? So in the end, the information from geotax and geologists needs to contribute to development of the event tree. We develop the more likely, less likely tables. We evaluate the risk and the likelihood of failure, and then we plot that stuff on an FN chart. So Initially, if we don't have information or if we don't have a well-built geologic concept model, we might have a very high uncertainty band around our risk assessment. But then if we can refine it or if we can do more data up, more data assessment up front, we can maybe walk away with a much more confined uh, uncertainty band around our risk assessment. But we do have to ask, you know, are the, are the conditions and characterizations reasonable? Are the conclusions based on the available data and previous analyses? And are the uncertainties adequately portrayed? All right, so here's concluding slide. Collect data, understand, portray, and communicate it. We need to define the engineering properties, conditions, constraints, uncertainties. Start building the more likely, less likely factors in, in, in your head or in, uh, in some space where you can reference them. Um, and put this all into the context of the geologic setting, the hazards you identify, and the possible risk driving failure modes, and build your concept model around that framework. And this is what how we build the case, how you make your judgments, and how you support those judgments and communicate them. So we work with team members, work 
across multidisciplinary uh, group of people. We have to ask questions. We have to understand the other disciplines and the failure modes relating to other disciplines because that helps the geologic and geotech folks focus their attention onto the right subsurface condition properties. Um, participate in a risk assessment. Be active and be a participating member throughout the process. Ask questions, explain yourself, don't, don't, don't hold back, you know, be participating member of the risk assessment team. And then overall, stay involved in the overall process in documentation, transfer of information, and participate in these discussions and the meetings. It builds your skills, builds your understanding of the process, and, and better, better supports the risk assessment team. Um, this is a quick list of numerous uh, failures and incidents, case studies. And I believe it's incumbent on engineering geologists, geotechs working in dam safety to have some understanding of, of as many of these as possible. These help build wisdom. They help build your understanding of failure modes, conditions that went to the failure modes, and the sequence that had to occur for those failure modes to be realized. So it's important to bone up on and understand failure modes as much as possible. 